Hi folks, this is uh, Richard Hall here from Stonehenge RTLO and this is uh, looking at the night sky that we have in uh, the wire wrapper at the moment. Now, let's just bring a few things up. There's another lovely picture of me. Okay, it's a night sky. <laughs> okay. What I'd like to start off talking about, first of all, with, for those of you who may be interested in the stars or having think, oh, I'd love to have a look at some of these wonderful things in the night sky, where well, you've got a great opportunity coming up in January. Because what we're going to be holding out at Stonehenge is what we call the Stardate Festival. All right? And it will run for over the Wellingtons a long weekend. So it goes from Friday, uh, Friday uh, evening on January the 20th, right the way through to Monday the 23rd all right and there's going to be a whole variety of things there first of all we're going to be doing night sky tours at night uh, photography you can learn how to do photography um, we're also going to have a telescope viewing and there's going to be quite a lot of telescopes out there for you to have a look at some of the different wonders in our summer evening sky but in addition to the astronomy there'll be lots of other things happening there'll be lectures talks uh, displays not just about astronomy but from other because uh, we invited other people from the wire wrapper to be part of it to come along and do various things out there we're also going to have movies on and so on and so forth so that's the stardate festival wellington's long weekend friday january the 20th to 23rd and if you think of coming do do put your name down a book in so that we know the number of people st staying there uh, many people overnight will be stopping overnight and <clears throat> if they bring their own tent they can camp in on some of the ground there okay we're not a camping site as such but it does mean that you don't have to worry about getting home late at night all right so that's the star date festival that we've got coming up well Moving on from that, let's have a look at our, our night sky at the moment, which is very similar to the night sky I was showing you a couple of weeks ago. Uh, at this time of the year, when we look to the, the south, we see that the um, Milky Way is virtually laying along the horizon. Uh, so I think it's actually one of the most least spectacular night skies. That, uh, uh, that's all going to be changing soon. Um, Southern Cross is at its lowest point in the sky. All right. You can pick it out there and it's followed by the the two pointer stars all right and so the milky way is laying along the milk uh, laying along the horizon but what we do have however is at right now is some spectacular views of some of the other things in the sky how up in the sky the bright star looking to the south is canopus which is the second brightest star in the sky and then above canopus are the two magellanic clouds and these, these look like uh, detached portions of the Milky Way. But in fact, they're nothing to do with the Milky Way at all. In fact, they're actually satellite galaxies. And they <coughs> orbit around their own galaxy. They're, they're some of the most distant things you can see. Uh, the large cloud is about 165,000 light years away. The smaller cloud, 190,000 light years away. And... The interesting thing about when we analyse the star stuff, the star material in these clouds, in, in, particularly in the large cloud, there's massive star formation taking place. We find the composition of stars is more like the great galaxy in Andromeda than it is like our own, the stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. And it's careful observations and measuring the motions of objects tells us that there was a close encounter between the, our Milky Way galaxy and the great galaxy in Andromeda several millions of years ago. And what they reckon happened is that the, what we see as a milky, uh, the Magellanic clouds are detached portions of that galaxy which were ripped off and then captured by our Milky Way galaxy. Well, at the moment, of course, the uh, Andromeda galaxy is about uh, two million, just over two million light years away. But it's it's all it's all moving round and changing. Uh, we now know that the great Milky Way, a great galaxy in Andromeda is actually moving towards us Milky Way again. And so we can look forward to the possibility of a collision with this galaxy. But don't worry too much, it's going to be 
uh, quite a few millions of years before that actually going to happen. So that's the Magellanic Clouds that you can see. And that's to say they look at spectacular objects. And a bit like the Southern Cross, they're always in our night sky. They never set. So if you come along to that star date, you'll be able to appear through a large telescope at some of the awesome objects inside those clouds. Turning around to, uh, and looking to the north, all right, uh, of course, obviously, what I picked out before, the most obvious of is the uh, of stars, that is, is the Great Square, uh, the North. And just above the Great Square, of course, is that brilliant starlight object, and you can't miss it. It's no star at all. This is, in fact, the planet Jupiter. And Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. And indeed, when you look at it for a telescope, it looks like a a little miniature solar system because you can see several of the moons and it's got about 80 odd moons but four of them are bright enough to be seen with a pair of binoculars orbiting around and so that's jupiter we have there and then just in front of jupiter but not quite so obvious it's still a bright starlight object is the planet saturn uh, and that's the other giant planet with its system of rings and in fact in fact saturn's actually got more um moons than Jupiter has. So we've got these two big bright planets in the sky and then we look down towards the eastern horizon and of course we see a very important star cluster. This is Matariki we can see rising up. And when you go out and you have a look at this panorama of stars, actually what you're looking at is that same panorama that would be seen at the beginning of, near dawn at the time of the beginning of the Maori New Year. There's Matariki there. And just to the right of Matariki is Aldebaran, the brightest star in uh, Taurus the Bull. But just rising up, you can't, it's not shown on this image because it's actually slowly moving backwards, is the planet Mars. Once you're up around about 10 or 11 o'clock, you'll notice a big bright reddish star over there in the east. That is the planet Mars. And of course, there's been more science fiction stories written about Mars than any other place in the solar system and during december we're going to make the earth is going to make its closest approach to uh, mars and so uh, next next month we'll be having a special program about mars and what we can actually see and some of the grand stories behind this world of all the planets in the solar system it is the one that's most like the earth anyway we'll be having a look at that later on now, hopefully, uh, many of you saw that wonderful uh, uh, total eclipse that we had of the moon. Uh, here we see some photographs of that, of that eclipse as it changes course. And here's another spectacular one coming up here of the, of the eclipse of the moon. Why does the moon actually go red? It's uh, quite an amazing thing, really. What it is, is that uh, when we get a, a, a solar eclipse, you can get two eclipses. One's a solar, the other's a lunar one. We get a solar eclipse when the, the moon moves in between the Earth and the sun. And the moon completely blocks out the sun. Right? And then that's when we get these spectacular eclipses. You know? But that, to know all of that happen, everything has to be perfectly aligned. Right? Doesn't happen very often, so solar eclipses are very rare. The other eclipse occurs when the, moon, the Earth moves in between the moon and the sun. Now, the, moon, the Earth's a hell of a lot bigger than the Moon, so we see more uh, lunar eclipses. But the Moon never goes completely dark. And the reason for that is because the Earth has got an atmosphere. And the light from the Sun, is a lot of it is absorbed by the atmosphere, but the red light is bent and refocused on the Moon. All right? So this is light that's coming through the Earth's upper, upper atmosphere. And how red the Moon appears, of course, often depends on what sort of activity has been happening on the Earth. Volcanic eruptions and things like that can make it a lot darker at certain times. So that's the lovely lunar eclipse. And there's going to be another one in about three years if you miss that one. But I always, I always like to wonder, what did our ancestors think of all these things, you know? Imagine, just you think of the moon, just not only eclipses, where suddenly the moon went red. That would have been pretty scary for our ancestors, wondering what was happening. But the moon itself, its continual changing, uh, its shape, as we see the phases of the moon, going from new through to full moon and so on. And so the moon's in a constant state of change. But the reality is that our ancestors probably knew far more about the stars than the average person does today. 
because quite frankly their lives depended upon it. All those things that we take for granted in, in our world at the moment, uh, navigation, all right? We don't need to know how to navigate these days because we just got it in our car and we press a button and the, the tour is there and uh, the roads are marked. But there was a time, of course, when there was no technology like that around. And so people could, could navigate when they did so by observing the sky and celestial objects, particularly stars in the sky. Of equal, perhaps even greater importance, of course, was timekeeping. Again, we've got clocks around us all the time. We think, oh, you know, what's timekeeping? Well, you see, knowing the time was a matter of life and death for our ancestors. Because if you sailed at the wrong time, you never came back. If you um, planted your seeds at the wrong time, your crop could fail. So knowing when to do things, when you could plant, when you could harvest, was uh, something that our ancestors did by looking at the stars and so on. And one of the prime important objects in the sky, which is in fact our, the great clock itself, the celestial clock, is the moon. Now, the phases of the moon that we see occur simply because as the uh, moon orbits around the Earth, we see a greater or lesser amount of the, the surface of the moon which is illuminated the night and the dark side so when the uh, moon is in between us and the sun uh, essentially we can't see it very well because we're looking at the looking at the dark side of the moon at night sky night side the only time we actually notice it of course is when an eclipse occurs and it moves in front of the sun altogether the other end of the scale we've got a full moon now a full moon occurs when the earth is between the sun and the moon all right and when we're looking at the uh, moon then uh, we're looking at full light all right and so but the melt we can see gives us those different phases going from starting off from new moon to a thin crescent then to a half moon which is often called first quarter then it turns gibbous gets bigger than for a uh, half moon full and then the sequence goes back again to new moon again and this is where the word the month comes from because how long does it take the moon to go around the earth in this cycle one month that's where the word month comes from it is a month so you see our ancestors uh, one from one month to another will be either one new moon to the next or one full moon to the next that is the month of the year and there's an on average of about 12 months in a year not precisely that amount but You've got to remember that in the ancient world, the beginning of the year, for example, was, um, was either a solstice or an equinox, and that could occur in the middle of the month. Now, we don't use the moon as a calendar anymore in the Western world, but that doesn't apply to most people around the world. So our Asia, China, uh, and so on and so forth, people still use a lunar calendar where each month begins at new moon, and that's the way in which it goes. Now... The week that you use is also to do with the cycle of the moon, right? It takes seven days, right, to go from a new moon, when we can first see it, it to the to first quarter, a half moon. So in other words, from new moon to first quarter, when we see the half moon, and we call it first quarter because it's a quarter of the cycle, takes seven days. Another seven days after that, the moon is full. That's the second week. Another seven days after that, we're down to last quarter. And then we've got finally the last week altogether when it goes back to being new. And incidentally, the reason why it was called a new was in the ancient world, people believed that's exactly what it was. What used to happen, the, new, the moon would appear as a thin crescent, get brighter and brighter and brighter until it was full. Then it will fade away and disappear. And what our ancestors originally thought, that what, when they saw the new moon, they saw a brand new moon resurrected from the eternal fires of the sun. Right? So there's your new moon, and there's your weeks. And you see, this is the great clock in the sky that people have been using for thousands of years. So, for example, if, if uh, you were living in some uh, neighbouring uh, village or uh, tribe, I could arrange to meet up with you at next full moon. Well, if you were about five or six days travel away, I'd know when the moon was near first quarter, time for me to set out on my journey. And that's how people have been doing timekeeping for literally thousands upon thousands of years. 
So that was the, that cycle there. Okay. Now while while I'm talking about that, I should mention that uh, we've been missing out on some of our music that we've been having out at Stonehenge due to the covert and so on. Uh, but it's going to be coming back in action at the moment, and uh, the music club will be back. The next event is on Thursday, November the twenty fourth. Right. So this two weeks away thursday november the 24th out at stonehenge uh five bucks a donation as you come in and you've got live music there and it's an open mic and that means that if you want to come along and have a sing or play your guitar you'll be welcome to do so okay so we've got that coming up now going back to what we were we talking about a little bit of before and to showing you how things are related to the sky and celestial objects. We talked about the seven days of the week, right? And which is a part of the cycle of the moon. But the days of the week in turn are named after celestial objects. So let's briefly have a look at these. Okay, first of all, we've got Sunday, all right, which comes from the word soul. And the names of the names of the um, Days of the week are actually named after uh, uh, Norwegian gods, right? Nor Norse gods and so on. But they, they are essentially identical as far as the deity is concerned to the Roman gods as well. So Sol, right? And that's sun, the day of the sun, Sunday, right? After Sunday, you've got Moon's Day, Monday. It's named after Marnie, so Moon Day is on Monday, right? Then after Monday, we have Tuesday, Day, which is named after the Norse god Tyre, who was the god of war, which is identified with the Roman god Mars. So we've got the sun, the moon, and the planet Mars, marking Tuesday. Then after Tuesday, we've got Wednesday, and Wednesday is named after Odin, the king of the gods. Uh, uh, it was also known as Woden, so this is Woden's Day and is identified in the sky with the, Mer with the planet Mercury because Mercury was the messenger of the gods that sent the messages out to all the other gods of what to do. Right? So that's a Woden symbol there. Then after Wednesday, well, we got Thor's day. And that's named after the Roman god Thor. Okay, so, and he, he is represented by Jupiter, which we've got in the sky at the moment. So there you are, that's Thor's day, okay, which is Thursday. And then finally we got, uh, well not finally, we got Friday, which is Frigg's day, named after Frigg. Uh, and she was a very powerful goddess. Um, uh, she was a god of uh, enlightenment, wisdom, wisdom, sex, and so on and so forth, you know. And she was always getting up to mischief as well. So you've probably heard the term frigging around. Well, that's where it actually comes from, frig. It comes from the Norse goddess, and that's Frigg's Day, which is Friday. And her symbol in the sky is the planet Venus. Then finally, the last day of the week is Saturday. And that's named after Saturn, Saturn Day. Of course, Saturn was the god of death. This marks the end of the week. So that's the last day of the week is Saturn. And then, of course, we have a new one and Sunday comes along as well. So that, that's the days of the week, all named after celestial objects. And it was believed, of course, in the ancient world, with each of these days, that particular deity had a lot more power. So if you wanted certain things from a particular god, like Frigg, right? Friday will be the time to pray to her, okay? So there you go. But it's, it's not just that. You've got to also bear in mind that the, the celestial objects also have lots and lots of effects on them. One of the big ones, of course, is the tides. You, we're all used to tides going in and out. Well, what's that all about? Well, that's actually caused by the, the moon, as the moon orbits around the sun. The fluid on the Earth's surface, the water, gets dragged towards it. So as it, the moon goes around, so we get high and low tides. As the Earth spins on its axis, we get two a day, all right? But the other important thing to remember is that the size of a tide will often depend upon, uh, you know, uh, how close the moon is, because the distance from the moon varies and so on. And often we talk about flooding, and I always, what I always do is keep my idea. When there's a lot of rain, I keep an eye on the moon, because if you get a lot of rain at the time of full moon or new moon, right, when the moon, 
the sun and the earth all aligned that is when you're going to get the biggest tides so if you if you've got a lot of water coming down and suddenly you're near getting near full moon watch out all right because that's going to be your big tides but of course a lot of the stuff i'm telling you now is stuff that our ancestors would, would have known thousands and thousands of years ago because this knowledge of the environment was all important to, for their survival so that's the tides also the moon is um also a light in the sky at night all right and indeed you've all heard of the harvest moon for the harvest moon that occurs near autumn at the, the full moon at the time of the harvest moon for those of you watching this on tv here you can actually see a photograph of the harvest moon at stonehenge and look how much lighter it is you can see around and the reason why it was called the harvest moon because that full moon was used for people to bring in the harvest people would work all the way through the night to bring in that valuable harvest at the time of the harvest moon right so there's another one of the things that you uh, probably wonder why it's called a harvest moon in the first place okay well again when we look at the moon we can see all these magical things happening and of course our ancestors believed that the celestial objects were causing these changes to occur the seasonal changes and so on and of course that is the root of the belief in astrology and so on but when we look at the moon we talk about the man in the moon of course the man in the moon is Marnie right the god but there's those light and dark markings and for a long while people have not wondered what they were we call them uh, man in the moon because that's all these things are named from the northern hemisphere but when i look at the sh dark shadows i see a rabbit on the moon uh, maybe you can see that as well all right but what, do, what did our ancestors think about this bright object in the sky well let's have a think about it if let's have a look at the actual physical nature of our moon and so on i've just for those of you watching this on tv i've just brought up the earth now if you were on the earth looking at the moon uh sorry if you were on the moon looking at the earth that's how big it would appear in the sky and that immediately tells you the difference in the size between the earth and the moon all right let's bring that up a little bit closer that you can see it there you have got the earth and the moon to scale so you can see as the moon's considerably smaller than the earth it's not only <clears throat> it's not only small in size it's actually smaller in 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 mass uh, you could actually fit 81 earth uh, sorry 81 moons inside the earth right? so obviously the earth has a far greater uh, effect on the uh, moon than the the other way around right but of course when you look at the, whenever we see a picture of the earth and the moon we always put them together so you can see these sizes but that doesn't show you the distances because the distances is also great as well so let's bring that into perspective now you've all traveled at 100 kilometers per hour in a car well if you were traveling 100 kilometers per hour how long would it take you to drive right the way around the earth imagine you could drive over the oceans as well so non-stop in a circle 100 kilometers an hour how long would it take you to drive around the earth well the answer is send our little car around the answer is journey to around the earth would take 17 days so in other words if you could drive in a straight line at 100 kilometers per hour it would take you 17 days to travel right the way around the earth okay so it takes you 17 days to get to the around the earth how long would it take you to get to the moon well, well a little bit further because if you traveled at 100 kilometers to the moon journey to the moon all right would take you five months all right now this is telling you that the moon is a lot further away than you probably thought right? 17 days to go around the earth five months to get to the moon so let's bring them to scale for those people watching on tv now i've just brought up the earth and the moon to scale both in physical size and their distance apart all right so yeah 384,000 kilometers between the two right. one of the important things to actually bear in mind actually and particularly when we look at the past the moon is slowly moving further away from the earth due to the tidal effects that means in the past the moon was a lot closer right and indeed we believe when the moon was very young going back into the early stages of the earth it was only about 10 20,000 kilometers away 
So can you imagine moonrise, you know, at that time? Imagine the sizes of the tides. It's estimated if the moon was that close, the difference between high tide and low tide would be around about two kilometres. Yeah, pretty spectacular. OK, so there we have it. All right. Now, but of course, when, when we're looking at the moon, it's also all to do with the surface features on the moon. All right? And those light and dark markings are actually clues to what it's all about. Is this for those of you watching this on TV? You've got this wonderful photograph of the full moon. Well, the dark areas which you can see are actually volcanic plains, uh, basalt plains, and they're much younger than the lighter areas, which are uh, rock, granite, and, and stuff like that. All right, and um, and that's why they've got fewer craters on them. They were formed at a much later stage. All right, but the interesting thing is if you look at the the uh, the Earth, you find exactly the same thing. Take away the water from the moon and you'll find the oceans would be black like the moon, right? Because they too are basalt basins, right? That's why they're, they're much heavier rock and that's why they're lower than the continental rocks which are lighter, right? So that's what you can see there. But when we're going close up, of course, on the moon in our telescope, we see this absolutely wonderful terrain of mountains and craters. And the moon is literally covered in craters, all right? And the reason for this is, is not because it's that some special characteristic of the moon. The Earth also gets... Craters are created by impacts from asteroids and other particles. And the Earth gets hit just as often, probably more so, than the moon does. But the difference is the Earth has got an atmosphere, water... And it has got a weather system and that weather system erodes things away. So when a crater is formed, you know, within a few millions of years, it's, it disappears and it's just eroded away. On the moon, on the other hand, when a crater is formed, it stays there virtually perpetually. And many of these craters we're looking at, like in this picture right now, they go back literally billions of years in time. Right. So the moon, when we look at it through the telescope, gives us an opportunity of looking at a world through the passage of time and also to look at what the Earth would have looked like in those very, very early stages. And of course, the moon is a world we've visited. For those of you watching this on TV, you can see a man walking across the moon. And there in the sky is the, the Earth. Right? And one of the points that was made by just about every person who went to the moon was there looking back at the earth and as one of them said he said when i looked at it i put my hand up i could cover the earth with my thumb and he said i looked at that little ball in the sky only to realize that just everywhere i knew everywhere i'd been all my life every person every creature i've known exists there on that little planet that little ball in the sky called the earth and of course right now what we're doing is looking for other worlds beyond there OK, just to recap on finally on the things, we don't forget we've got the Music Club coming up on Thursday. It's always the last, the, uh, the last Thursday of the month. This one is on November the 24th. We've got that coming up. Also coming up at the time of the solstice, all right, we've got, um, this is on Thursday, December the 26th, is the summer solstice. And we're also going to be doing the stories of the summer solstice, which includes the Star of Bethlehem. What was the Star of Bethlehem? And all those those legends attached to it, we're going to be taking you through those at Stonehenge. That's going to be at 8 o'clock on Thursday, December the 22nd at Stonehenge. And hopefully you'll also be able to see the sunset there at the solstice as well. So we've got that coming up at the solstice. Then as we go into January, of course, we've got the Great Star Date Festival occurring uh, on January 20th to 23rd, which is Wellington's long weekend. And incidentally, that star cluster you can see there uh, is actually one of the things I'd like to show you for our telescope. They're absolutely awesome. OK, just to remind you, just a couple of things we have got uh, at Stonehenge right now. We've got laser star treks. That means that you can come out and we'll take you around the stars on a starry night. And also deep space tours where we use telescopes and so on. You can book into those. And Stonehenge at the moment is open from Wednesday to Sunday from 10am to 4pm. And having said that, I'll catch you up in the near future. <laughs>